this uh, report uh, get uh, has but uh, problem in uh, Switzerland uh, and uh, report Professor Neil Binkley. Rebecca Armon's score, clinical, practical clinical use uh, at, at TPS uh, in six steps. Thank you. I am standing in for uh, Professor Didier Hans today. Uh, these are uh, Didier's slides, and uh, the, the uh, speakers are, as you see here, and these are Didier's words. Uh, Professor Hans the wild and me the wise. I think he's saying the young and the old. Uh, but be that as it may, you can see that Professor Hans is clearly younger than I am, and I will do the best to uh, share his slides uh, with you today. <clears throat> this is the overview. We'll start with osteoporosis, and uh, all of you are aware that osteoporosis is not simply low bone mineral density, but it is also microarchitectural deterioration of bone tissue, leading to an increased risk for fracture. This is an uh, old consensus definition, uh, consensus conference definition, but it's one that I like very much and it's one that I share with my patients uh, all the time. You're also aware of the, these data, I believe. This is a classic study that Ethel Cyrus published a number of years ago from the Nora report, and what it shows is that the majority of osteoporotic fractures occur in people who have a T-score better than a negative 2.5. And uh, the, is it because these people have microarchitectural deterioration that is not captured by BMD? Can we address that then with TBS? And what is TBS? And trabecular bone score is a software program that estimates bone texture information from the uh, spine scan, as uh, you just saw. It is a unitless index, and it is not a physical measurement. What it actually is, is comparing pixel by pixel x-ray photon absorption from the DEXA scan. Therefore, it is a surrogate of bone microarchitecture and of fracture risk, and it provides information about fracture risk additive to both BMD and clinical risk factors. And here is the principle of trabecular bone score. <clears throat> uh, the uh, photo on the left is flying in an airplane over a forest, and you can't see each individual tree, but you can see where lo the loggers have gone in and removed chunks of the forest. And uh, here, if we then take this homogeneous forest and apply it to a homogeneous vertebral body, we would get a high TBS, and conversely, we would get a low TBS. And it's important, I think, to emphasize that we are not seeing the trabeculae. TBS is a surrogate of microarchitecture, and this is a slide that Bill Leslie shared with me, and it basically says that if you look at the top of an iceberg, this is the macrostructure or the texture, but it reflects the entire iceberg and therefore the microarchitecture. And so uh, TBS is a surrogate measure, not a direct assessment of microarchitecture. The TBS results are obtained simply by the software post-processing the spine DEXA. And as such, it is possible to have identical BMDs, but dramatically different trabecular bone score. And here are two patients on the left with identical bone mineral density, but the person on top in green has homogeneous microarchitecture and therefore a high trabecular bone score, whereas this individual on the bottom with the identical bone mineral density has osteoporosis, heterogeneous texture, 
and therefore low trabecular bone score. So uh, TBS then at provides additional information in addition to what we get with bone mineral density. TBS has been accepted worldwide as an independent predictor for fracture by a multitude of organizations, as you see here. And it correlates with microarchitecture in an in vivo bone biopsy study of iliac crest uh, histomorphometry. And as you see here, the trabecular bone score calculates, or correlates rather, with trabecular number, trabecular separation, and bone volume per tissue volume, or BVTV. Uh, so it uh, is, in fact, correlated and documented to be uh, cor well correlated with histomorphometry. You'd think then it would predict fractures, and indeed it does. And what this slide is showing is uh, that uh, the incident fracture risk over here on the vertical axis, uh, as you go from normal bone to osteopenia to osteoporotic bone, the fracture risk goes up. And similarly, as you go down to poorer trabecular bone score, the fracture risk goes up, such that the individuals in the lowest tertile of TBS and the lowest tertile of BMD, i.e. osteoporosis, are at the highest risk for fracture. As a result, TBS is being utilized to adjust for frax. And let's just focus on the orange lines here. Uh, these are two patients, age 50 and 80, with the same 10-year major osteoporotic fracture risk of 21%. So they're right back here. As the trabecular bones in individuals who have a better or higher trabecular bone score, the FRAX calculation goes down. And conversely, as the trabecular bone score gets worse, the FRAX calculation goes up. The dark orange is the younger woman, the light orange is the older woman. So FRAX has a greater effect, TBS has a greater effect on FRAX in younger women than in older women. And this is simply showing uh, how it is done. If you go to the uh, website, uh, you see that we've entered the risk factors, we've calculated it, and there is this box down here that says adjust with TBS. Uh, we click that and uh, we can enter the uh, TBS value, and I'm going to jump too fast, and there it is. Uh, when we have an individual with low trabecular bone score, the MOF risk goes from 21% to 26%, and uh, conversely, when we have a good trabecular bone score, it would go down. As a result of altering the FRAX calculation, we can alter the uh, individual's uh, risk to one side or another of a treatment intervention threshold. And that matters most, unsurprisingly, for those who are close to the cut point. Uh, and uh, so if we use, for example, an MOF 20% risk, as is the case with the National Osteoporosis Foundation, in women who are close to the cut point, the, uh, those uh, were altered to one side or the other of the treatment threshold 17.5% of the time. This is a new concept that's out there, and it's going to require the software to help us do it. And that is to use TBS to adjust the bone mineral density T-score. Uh, these data are published uh, by Bill Leslie and Didier Hans in Osteoporosis International last year. The equations are showing here, shown here. I'm fairly confident that none of us are going to be altering the T-score in the clinic by making these calculations, but I understand the software is going to be providing it uh, very soon. You've heard earlier today that TBS is helpful 
in secondary osteoporosis. I'm going to go through this very quickly because we've heard about it uh, earlier on a number of occasions. But suffice it to say that TBS is associated with fracture risk independently of BMD in patients with type 2 diabetes, glucocorticoid exposure, primary hyperparathyroidism, HIV, and renal failure. Here's just an example of the studies with diabetes, and uh, it uh, basically says that uh, uh, individuals who have type 2 diabetes and uh, that BMD tends to be high, uh, and uh, despite this high BMD, they are at risk for fracture, but this is captured by the L1 through 4 trabecular bone score. In addition, this slide, the right-hand picture, basically says that uh, the TBS correlates with glucose control, uh, such that uh, individuals who have poor glucose control, the TBS uh, identifies those as having poorer microarchitecture, and this is just uh, the forest plots of meta-analyses documenting that TBS tends to be low in individuals with diabetes. So I think the punchline here is that, that TBS is a good tool to help us with our patients with type 2 diabetes. Does TBS have a role in patient monitoring? This is controversial. <clears throat> but I, I think that we we should think about what our drugs are doing and how they might affect the bone microarchitecture. And so really the only medications that we have that could positively affect the bone microarchitecture are our bone anabolic drugs. Teriparatide, in some regions of the world, abaloparatide and romosozomab. And so those are really the only agents that we should expect much from microarchitecture. There is a suggestion that denosumab may have some positive effects on microarchitecture, but the bisphosphonates and estrogen are simply slowing bone remodeling, allowing us to fill in the remodeling space, not build new trabeculae. So you would expect a BMD increase, but no effect on microarchitecture. Conversely, pathophysiologic uh, states such as menopause, glucocorticoid use, and aromatase inhibitor therapy not only cause the BMD to go down, but also cause microarchitectural deterioration. So in various drug treatments or various physiologic states, you would expect differing effects on BMD and TBS. And indeed, that is what is seen. So this is a summary slide, and let's just go over here to PTH. This is the one that has the greatest effect on spine BMD, and it has the greatest effect on uh, TBS. So we get roughly a 10% increase in BMD and roughly a 5% increase in TBS. In contrast, because the bisphosphonates are only filling in the remodeling space, what we see is this roughly 5% improvement in spine BMD and little to no effect on TBS. And uh, then again on the other end of the spectrum, the aromatase inhibiting drugs lower BMD, and because they also damage the microarchitecture, they lower the TBS. So thinking about the physiology and thinking about how the drugs work uh, should allow us to, in essence, guide our therapy. And that's what Didier, I think, is alluding to, is that we can use these concepts uh, to maybe choose our therapies. And that's where he's going here, is to which treatment. So when you're thinking about treating your patients, the first thing to do, as you just heard, is to check the image quality. And here he gives us the old GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. 
And so if you've got garbage for DEXA, you cannot make a good clinical decision. So here again, check for edge detection, make sure the numbering is appropriate, look for vertebral fractures and other artifacts. And uh, as, I, as uh, we have not mentioned in this presentation, TBS has a BMI limitation. If your BMI is too low or too high, TBS does not work. Uh, in this slide, if you look at the image on the left, do you see an internal artifact there? The answer is yes. What we have here is an L2 vertebral fracture, which would spuriously elevate the BMD and alter the microarchitecture, and therefore, in this patient, L2 was excluded, and you can know that because you have the parentheses around it. So L2 was appropriately excluded by the technologist for both the BMD and the TBS measurement. Secondly then, characterize the patient. And the, these numbers are data that are being brought forward by Medimaps, the makers of TBS, but they are based on the McCluskey meta-analysis. And so they are, I think, really quite robust. And then, uh, in uh, using that approach, if the TBS is greater than 1.310, we call that normal microarchitecture up here in the yellow and the green. If it's worse than or below 1.230, that's consistent with degraded microarchitecture, and in between is partially degraded on microarchitecture. That concept is something that our patients can understand. And they can understand that that is bad. And so if we tell them that the TBS says you have degraded bone microarchitecture, this is what your architecture looks like. And if you were this person up on that scaffolding, I'm thinking you would not feel very comfortable. So this is something that our patients can picture, and I do use the scaffolding analogy with my patients all the time. <clears throat> this is a concept that uh, Professor Hans is bringing forward, and that is bone health categories. And so we're all familiar with the bone health categories of BMD T-score, normal osteopenia osteoporosis. Uh, he's then suggesting that we uh, can combine that with TBS, normal, partially degraded, and degraded. And so ideally, you would like to be up here. If you're over here with osteoporosis and degraded architecture, you're at very high risk. And if you're only osteopenic but degraded microarchitecture, you're at high risk. And uh, then consider uh, who should I treat? And you can uh, treat either based upon a TBS-adjusted FRAX or a TBS-adjusted T-score, depending on your country's guidance. Then, and again, this is Professor Hans' table. Uh, he's suggesting, and I think there's some logic here, that uh, if you are at the very highest risk T-score osteoporosis, degraded microarchitecture, that starting therapy, either with denosumab or with one of our bone anabolics, is reasonable. And indeed, there is an increasing literature that demonstrates that using bone anabolics as first-line therapy in such patients has a greater reduction in fracture risk than using anti-resorbers. And uh, conversely then, if you uh, have uh, uh, T-score osteoporosis but only partially degraded bone microarchitecture by TBS, he's suggesting denosumab, or if you have normal TBS, maybe a bisphosphonate. Uh, and uh, you know, I think there is some logic uh, behind this table. It's something that I think we can use to help us with our clinical judgment. Here he's going into a very controversial area that suggests that we should treat to a lower risk zone. This is kind of analogous to the treat to target 
approach that has been advocated by others. And he's basically saying, well, if we have somebody here in uh, highest risk based on BMD and T-score, that if we use a bone anabolic, maybe we can get them up into here, uh, and at that point in time, change therapies. That's a concept that I believe needs further, uh, further documentation. These, this approach, and this is what I just showed you over here, is the risk zones. That apparently is going to be released sometime with the new TBS uh, update very soon. So, uh, in conclusion, TBS uh, predicts vertebral and non-vertebral fracture risk in men and women independently of BMD and independently of clinical risk factors by adding a textural component that is a surrogate for microarchitecture. It allows you to identify more, and I would say identify better, your patients at risk for fracture, therefore allowing you to adjust your therapeutic decision and improve your patient management. He suggests that it can help you with monitoring over time. I believe that needs more work, but it could well be. And um, finally, and this is anecdotal, but I totally agree with him, that it can help, technical, that it can help you enhance compliance by sharing with them what their painting scaffolding looks like, what their microarchitecture looks like, <clears throat> and it encourage people uh, to utilize medications appropriately. It has the greatest power in osteopenic patients because these are people who are close to the therapeutic intervention cut points and we can either make their FRAX calculation better or worse by adding a TBS. Data that he did not show in this presentation is this bullet here that trabecular bone score tends to be less affected by degenerative arthritis of the spine. And it's not rare to see someone who has a BMD T score that is normal or plus one or plus two because of degenerative change and still has degraded bone microarchitecture. So that, I think, also provides good insight for patient care. And finally, it's important for patients with secondary osteoporosis uh, identifying degraded uh, architecture. And so his conclusion is don't treat more, treat better, treat those who uh, are in need. And that even if you don't see something, the structure may be important. And I thank you. What result is better? Increase bone mineral density in different region taxa and or increase the TBS significantly. Because what? Increased. What was the start of your question? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Yeah. Does 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 that increase it? Was that your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the question is, uh, does fat alter the BMD measurement or the TBS measurement or both? Okay. Um, theoretically... Yes. It's a very Okay, okay. Did I get it right? Okay, okay. Okay. Theoretically, uh, obesity should not alter the BMD calculation because we are comparing photon absorption over bone versus the adjoining soft tissue. And so I've got as much fat here as I've got there, this close. Uh, but a TBS is in fact dependent upon tissue thickness. And that is why TBS has the uh, BMI limitations. And off the top of my head, I think you cannot do TBS with a BMI I below 17 or above 37 or 38. Uh, so as of today, TBS has BMI limitations. They are moving toward 
actually including direct tissue thickness measurements in the TBS calculation. Um, so, uh, yes, historically TBS has been affected by obesity or thinness, and uh, it still does have BMI limitations. Yes, please, questions. Please. Uh, well, you know, thinking about TBS and the, in the site of uh, secondary also porosity, the glucose corticoid and diabetes, you know, and we know how actually what they do actually on a circulation. Can we actually uh, think about the cause of this, uh, you know, like osteopenia in diabetes and the osteopenia pelvis that uh, maybe uh, this microfecture, which is very, very important, is actually affected by the low circulation and atherosclerosis of the region. And uh, can we just learn about that, that we know that the statins using for the lipid flowing as a lipid flowing drug is actually affecting the bone and turn over the bone. So maybe we don't know that actually statins doesn't increase the BMD, but they probably affect micro uh, architecture. So can we maybe also learn about that, that we can use, besides all these anti disruptive drugs in, you know, in North Korea, that we can add statins, you know, in addition to the, the current drugs, following the evidence base that you just said about. I'm not sure that I got your question, but I, I think are you are you asking if we should add statins into our anti osteoporotic armamentarium? The cause of this, uh, you know, micro architecture deterioration, maybe the circulation is, is underlying process, and yep. then if it, if it comes to this conclusion, maybe we can provide the statins to all the osteoporotic patients. Yeah, I, I, I totally endorse what you're saying, is that we should be thinking about the pathophysiology that's causing the uh, microarchitectural deterioration and the, and the TBS to be low. I, I think I understand that physiology with glucocorticoid excess. I'm not sure that I understand it as well with diabetes. Um, uh, but I, I, I uh, totally endorse the concept of saying, let's use the tools that we have to try to understand the pathophysiology better. And maybe, therefore, make better informed therapeutic decisions. Yeah. Well, interesting, you know, in this way that, like, studies, they have a positive effect on the bone. And some bisphosphonate uh, and other anabolic agents, they have a positive effect on circulation. So it's actually... Yeah, I, 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 are you, you referring to the paper that came out last week? Because uh, I haven't read it yet. I, I, just, I just saw it come in on my email that apparently there's now a big uh, epidemiologic study that says statins are bad for the bones. I haven't read it yet, so I, I can't comment on it. But, um, uh, yeah, and, you know, I mean, the bisphosphonates work through the mevalonic pathway. I can at least think about uh, why statins might have deleterious skeletal effects. I don't want to believe that, and I have not read the paper. But uh, I, I totally agree that we need to think about the pathophysiology that we're dealing with, rather than just accept meta-analyses as truth. Yeah, I think that the animal studies show that statins have positive effects on the bone. And from these animal studies, you know, many studies were done. And, and that would make sense. Um, I, you know, in, ultimately, the inhib in inhibition of the melanonic pathway is kind of pretty much what the bisphosphonate or what the statins are doing. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. The next presentation.